I guess I should start by saying, and now for something completely different. Um, so thanks very much for your invitation to contribute to a discussion on building a research and action agenda to shape the future of work and employment, and for asking me to reflect on work I'm involved in with some people in this audience uh, on employment standards enforcement. Since only 31% are unionized, the majority of Canada's over 17 million workers rely on employment standards. Legislating minimum uh, conditions in areas such as wages, working conditions, vacations, leaves, termination, severance. Employment standards are especially important to workers in precarious jobs. Jobs that are particularly common among women, immigrants, and racialized groups here in Canada and elsewhere. Given the changing nature of employment, recent years have seen growing interest in them. And this interest, I would argue, stems partly from the sustained interventions of a small group of feminist scholars who have, over the last four decades, assessed the substance of these social minima versus other sources of labor protection because of their importance to workers belonging to equity-seeking groups. So in my time today, given the significance, the growing significance of employment standards as a source of labor protection for a growing number, and in the, uh, in the uh, face of mounting evidence of what I will characterize as an escalating enforcement gap, I want to suggest that it's perhaps time for researchers studying work and employment to include questions of enforcement more centrally in our gaze. And also, of course, in line with the plenary's focus and Gregor's request that panelists reflect on methodologies, I want to argue further that the tools of feminist political economy are, are invaluable in pursuing this kind of agenda. So after describing uh, briefly the research partnership from which some of the examples I'll draw emanates, I'll develop these contentions in three parts. First, I'll give you a quick overview of a kind of uniquely Canadian feminist political economy approach and the insights I believe it has offered to the study of employment standards. Then I'll uh, examine some constraints on workers' access to and realization of employment standards protections. And here I'll use the case of Ontario to consider two aspects of employment standards regulation, exemptions and special rules, and claims making and settlements. And I'll conclude with a few brief reflections on the utility of a feminist political economy approach in conducting everyday research inquiring into employment standards regulation. So my point of departure uh, in this talk is a collaborative research project for which uh, I serve as an academic principal investigator called Closing the Enforcement Gap, Improving Protection for People in Precarious Jobs. The research that is uh, being undertaken by a team of us focuses on workers' access to minimum uh, employment standards. And in constructing the project, we advance a multidimensional conception of what we call the enforcement gap. Depicted on this slide, this conception calls for investigating not only formal violations of existing legislation, but interrelated practices of evasion, erosion, and abandonment. While the definition of violation is pretty straightforward, building on the work of, of people like Bernhard et al., uh, evasion involves the adoption of employers of strategies to avoid workplace laws. Erosion entails the weakening of normative goals and policy objectives. And finally, abandonment involves practices that contravene societally agreed understandings of decent work in the knowledge that enforcement measures are weak. To date, our research team has focused on delineating the various manifestations of employment, stand of employment standards, violations, evasions, and erosion. Um, and this session offers me an opportunity to explicate a few of the ways in which this conception of the enforcement gap owes a debt to feminist political economy. So methodologically, I want to suggest that a feminist political economy approach can enable the study of how workers are deprived of protection, not only when laws are inadequate, for example, their scope is too narrow or are broken, but when they are avoided or evaded through subtle practices that are often linked to disparities in treatment on the basis of workers' social location. So I want to shift now to very briefly uh, uh, provide a bit of a review of, of what I take to be Canadian feminist political economy approach and um, some of the, note of some of the insights it's offered to date in the study of employment standards. So as an approach, feminist political economy is a holistic theory and a framework for action. It's dialectical, it's materialist, it's praxis-oriented, and it engages some of the tools of post-structuralism, 
and increasingly it addresses racialized and gendered social relations. This scholarly tradition is marked, as all of you will know, by a strong contribution to analyzing women's work, paid and unpaid. To this end, two of its analytical commitments, I think, are especially relevant to my focus here today. First is its persistent concern to highlight that what, what has been called the narrow economism uh, characterizing the political economy of labor tradition that, that uh, Paul alluded to, that is the, the determination to reveal the necessary and, and uh, integral relationship between social reproduction and production uh, in, the labor for, in, in the labor market. And in analyzing this relationship, scholars have used intersectional theorizing, thinking about international um, as well as domestic divisions of labor to address interactions between gender, migration status, indigeneity, race, and other axes of difference and inequality that shape relations of production. A second, I think, noteworthy analytical commitment here is, to, is the focus on contradictions and tensions as sources of continuity through change. So in studying uh, uh, employment standards, feminist political economists here in Canada have made, I think, several, uh, many contributions, several of which I'll name, um, particularly in understanding their nature and organization. So in the past four decades, they pointed to the bifurcated structure of labor law and policy. Uh, pivotal here, of course, uh, was Judy Fudge's Labor Law's Little Sister, the Employment Standards Act and the Feminization of Labor. They've also revealed that a majority of workers for whom employment standards are the principal source of labor protection are women, also to be um, responsible for, presumed to be responsible for the unpaid work required to produce people. And also presumed to have access to resources beyond the wage. And early interventions here that, I, that come to my mind are, are works by uh, Joan Sangster, Jane Ursel. More recently, uh, Canadian feminist political economists have looked at the quality and character of different forms of employment, such as temporary and part-time work. And a central achievement of such work has, to, has been to make visible uh, what um, uh, Deakin and others in this audience, uh, Muckenberger and others, have talked about as a normative model of employment underpinning access to a full range of labor protections. That is the standard employment relationship. And in particular, to uh, demonstrate its racialized and gendered contours in Canada. Another contribution has involved illustrating the problematic nature of the catch-all non-standard work and exploring dimensions of precariousness. Now I want to shift to illustrate how studies of employment standards enforcement can benefit from, the, from such insights by making reference to a couple of early findings of the Closing the Gap project. Here, I want to emphasize the utility of some insights, some such insights in addressing what Bernstein et al. have called regulatory effectiveness. That is, whether the law, in this instance, I'm going to talk about Ontario's Employment Standards Act, succeeds or fails in protecting workers, not only through its legislative design, but for other reasons, such as loop, legislative loopholes, lack of enforcement, um, or employer resistance. And I'm going to use two illustrations uh, noted in my outline, uh, reflecting the process of erosion that you saw in uh, one of my early slides. And they are the cases of exemptions and special rules, and the move to self-help and settlements in the claims process. So in Ontario to date, very little attention has been paid to the, diver to the divergent levels of protection flowing from complete or partial exemptions for individuals in a range of different occupations or workplaces under the Employment Standards Act. One example, just to give you an example of an exemption, is that of farm employees who are uh, exempt or partially exempt from provisions regarding minimum wage, rest periods, and a host of other types of standards. The list of exemptions has grown over time. And looking through the lens of feminist political economy shows that the incremental expansion of this list has particular consequences for workers belonging to socially marginalized groups. Specifically, this lens helps to reveal that those who suffer the consequences of the fraying 
of the margin, margins of, of employment standards protections most often are women presumed to have access, workers, excuse me, presumed to have access to support outside their wages, women, young people, and migrants. And for the purpose of this exercise, I'm going to use one example of an exemption, which is on the surface neutral to gender, to migration status, and other social relations of inequality, and who it, 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 it affects most. And that is an exemption on personal emergency leave for uh, firms of fewer than 50, uh, employing fewer than 50 people. So this exemption, uh, introdu this um, provision introduced in 2010 of unpaid emerg personal emergency leave is um, for unpaid emer personal emergency leave uh, not exceeding 10 days each calendar year. And in 2011, using data from the Survey of Labor and Income Dynamics to analyze the characteristics of employees and jobs subject to exemptions, we found that about three quarters of Ontario employees had full coverage to personal emergency leave because of the inequitable division of unpaid caregiving responsibilities between men and women. Employees' relative need for personal emergency leave varies by gender. Factors such as migration status also shape, and also shape this need. And notably, a simple analysis of who's covered by personal emergency leave does not disclose differential levels of protection related to gender, visibility, my, uh, visible minority status alone, or, or, or immigration status for that matter. However, when one conducts an intersectional analysis, it reveals a significant gender dimension to personal emergency leave. It illustrates that visible minority women and, and recent immigrant women are subject to lower levels of coverage than their male counterparts. And you see from this slide that only 75% of visible minority women are fully covered by the ESA's personal emergency leave provisions, whereas 80% of visible minority men have this protection. Moreover, only 72% of recent immigrant women are fully covered compared to 80% of uh, recent immigrant men. Such findings underscore the double jeopardy capturing how gender intersects with other social locations and shaping employment standards coverage. Now, another area of employment standards regulation illuminated by feminist political economy is the claims and resolution process. In Ontario, claims making increasingly reflects a self-help approach that encourages individual employees to take responsibility for lodging employment standards complaints and uses settlements as a primary mechanism for their resolution. This self-help approach is emblematic of neoliberal governance, and it's contributing to continuity through change in its deepening of long-standing power relations. In 2010, when Ontario adopted this Open for Business Act that I mentioned earlier, it established a, a requirement for aggrieved employees to first seek resolution for their complaints with their employer before gaining access to the claim system. While there are grounds for release from this requirement, a claims processor may now refuse an employment standards complaint if a complainant cannot demonstrate efforts to address his or her uh, claim with, their, with the employer. Also, in recent years, the MOL has expanded its use of settlements to expedite claim closure. Indeed, whereas settlements accounted for just 4% of claims in 2007, 2008, they, account for 12 they accounted for 12% in 2012, 2013. The expanded use of settlements stems partly from this Act's introduction of facilitated settlements involving employment standards officers in assisting the employee and the employer to reach an agreement outside the formal process. These forms of self-help entail a shift away from law enforcement to dispute resolution between individual parties at odds with the intent of employment standards to serve as social minima. They also negate this, uh, these unequal power relations uh, that surround the employment relationship. Substantiating this claim, one early finding of our, our work is that despite the growth and the growing number of non-unionized employees in Ontario, the total number of employment standards complaints received by the Ministry of Labour has declined steadily since 2009-10. Additionally, reflecting the deepening of, of long-standing power imbalances between employees and employers, we also see that the proportion of complaints with a reprisal component has grown 
suggesting that the self-resolution requirement increases the risks that employees must bear in the complaints process and is deterring employees for, from coming forward. And, and furthermore, the settlements that, that are emerging appear to be of poor quality. Between 2009 and 2013, never more than half of non-facilitated settlements were settled for 100% of what the employee claimed. And when employment standards officers exercise their new powers to facilitate settlements, outcomes tend to be even less favorable for employees than outcomes from settlements reached between the employee and the employer. So to sum up then, building on a sustained interventions of scholars studying employment standards over the last four decades, the operation of exemptions and special rules and the adoption of a self-help model of claims making and resolution today underscore the utility of this type of approach, that is a feminist political economy approach, in particular in understanding challenges pivotal to workers' realization of their minimum employment standards. In identifying and probing the enforcement gap, as we call it, a feminist political economy approach I would argue, help points the w helps to point the way to a research and action agenda centered on regulatory effectiveness and on securing social, mina social minima for all workers. And I would argue that this, our research agenda in the study of work and employment might also benefit from this type of approach. Thanks.